So th thank you very much, Diego, and the other organizers uh, for inviting me, and to all of you for coming. It's, it's really a treat to be here and have a chance to uh, participate a little bit in this workshop and to hear your, your thoughts and reactions about this uh, emerging and I think really exciting area of demographic research. And it's a double treat to be able to participate in this Demography Today series because uh, what I see is it really allows for sort of a continuity in this discussion uh, across uh, months and years. And I was really enjoying going back and looking at previous videos and thinking about connections uh, between what I'm working on and what, what previous speakers have been doing. So what I want to talk about today is um, research that I've been doing over the past uh, 10 years related to so what I, what I started to say is that um, I'm going to explain really what I've been doing in, uh, over the past 10 years related to a lot of the issues that we're interested in when it comes to digital demography. And my goal here is first to back up and talk a little bit in more general terms about this area and what it is that we mean by it and, and why it is that we're moving in this direction. And then I want to give you a very concrete example related to the research that I've been doing on mosquito-borne diseases. So. Uh, if you look back at the talk that Stephen Matthews gave here last year uh, on spatial methods, one of the points that he made when he was talking about spatial methods and actually the need for a lot better training in terms of spatial analysis was that we're confronting this rapidly changing environment of new sources of data, new methods, new techniques. And most of what he was talking about there was what we're now thinking of within demography under this heading of, of digital demography. And part of that starts with data itself, right? Part of it starts with all of these new sources of data that, we're, that we have access to. And that data consists of things like um, uh, data exhaust, right? All of these, these traces that are passively left uh, by all of us as we go about normal daily activities, including things like logging into a website and having our IP address recorded, somebody carrying around a telephone that's in connection with cell towers or that's transmitting data back and forth. Um, using Twitter, leaving geolocated positions on Twitter. All of these activities leave uh, what we can think of as uh, data exhaust, breadcrumbs, all of these traces that increasingly demographers, other social scientists, and a wide array of other actors are very, very interested in looking at and analyzing. So part of this is about this new data. Part of what we're interested in is a new set of tools that we have for accessing and analyzing that data. And okay. excellent, thank you very much. So, okay, so, um, so this new data consists of, of all sorts of new and exciting things, which you're going to be talking about today. Um, the new tools that we have consist of a range of devices and approaches that we have for accessing that data and getting it. And of course, the mobile phone is, is largely at the center of a lot of this because we have this device that not only has a huge number of sensors attached to it and a large amount of computational power and storage capacity, but it's also something that we all carry around with us every day. We incorporate it into our da daily lives. It's become so ub ubiquitous and, and commonplace that we don't even really need to repeat that in order to, to know um, what this, is, what this is meant in terms of both social transformation and a transformation in terms of potential methods. Um, these, what, what this combination of new, uh, new data and new tools has also led to is, has been a variety of new techniques that we use for analyzing this data. These include things like Monte Carlo, Carlo methods, uh, which take advantage of the fact that we now have a lot uh, better access to computational power, uh, Bayesian statistics, machine learning, network approaches, uh, the possibility for much more powerful and accessible spatial analysis, ecological momentary assessment where we can actually start to think about um, surveying people or asking people things uh, in different spatial and temporal contexts and understanding how their answers might change in those contexts, um, and things like participant networks which relate, relate directly to the citizen science approaches that I'm using. Networking our participants who are, who are participating in our studies together so that they can actually communicate with each other and communicate with us and even become part of the process of, of scientific exploration. All of this has meant new perspectives. Uh, and one, you know, one of the core things that I think we see in what we think of as digital demography, and I noticed that that's you know, on most of the talks uh, that you're going to be having for the, for the rest of, for the next few days is this, this incorporation of space and time into everything. And I think one reason for that is that if we think about the basic demographic, you know, the basic equation of population change, you know, sort of our core 
uh, equation within demography of, of births and deaths uh, and in and out migration. It's the in and out migration part that we've always had the hardest time measuring, right? Births and deaths, we do a much better job with because of official registries, but the movement part is much more difficult. And so one of the big things that this new um, data and this new configuration of techniques and tools has given us is the possibility for really getting at that mobility question. Um, that means incorporating space and time. It means understanding environmental com context much better. It means understanding social context. It means the possibility of building up networks that are in fact spatially explicit, that we can actually understand networks in space. Uh, and it means really, really importantly, not only having to think about scale, which of course we've always had to think about, but being able to choose different scales and being able to choose the units of analysis that are best suited for the questions we have. And that was another big point that, that Stephen Matthews made last year, and I, I was struck by, that we really need to always be thinking about this question of scale. Um, and what these new data sources and techniques allow us to do is actually to do that, to actually get at the scales that we want, and it really forces us to actually think that question through a lot more. So let me give you now a concrete example of the way this ties in um, to the work that I've been doing with mosquitoes. And I think this is a useful one because it actually captures almost all of the issues that we're dealing with. As a starting point, if your reaction is, you know, what are we doing talking about mosquitoes? We're here talking about human dem demography. What do mosquitoes have to do with humans? I will give you a few initial starting points, a few initial thoughts on that. The first is, well, mosquito-borne diseases are a really, really big problem in the world, right? So we have uh, this massive burden of diseases like dengue, Zika, chikungunya. These are maps of um, the, this is the, Zika, the dengue distribution uh, over space in terms of toxinous transmission. And this is a map actually done in the beginning of 2018. So Spain is not yet marked in red. Um, but as of this past fall, it should be marked in red for having had a toxinous vector-borne transmission of dengue. Um, Zika, uh, yellow fever, chikungunya. In terms of the scale of the problem, the magnitude of the, pro of the problem, uh, with dengue, we're talking about hundreds of millions of new cases every year. With Zika, chikungunya, and yellow fever, we're talking about millions of cases. All of those diseases are on the rise, as are um, the vectors that, that, that um, transmit them, the, the, particularly the mosquito vectors, uh, Aedes albopictus, the tiger mosquito, and Aedes aegypti, the yellow fever mosquito. Um, this is a growing problem. Malaria is a, has long, obviously long been a problem, and although it's been decreasing over recent years, we've now sort of hit a, um, a, a plateau where we don't seem to be getting any additional returns uh, to increased uh, um, efforts to eradicate malaria, and we're still left with uh, cases on the order of magnitude of hundreds of millions per year. So this is, extracts an enormous burden, and that burden, as you can see geographically, is distributed unequally across space. Right? It tends to be distributed in less developed countries, and if we look at a smaller scale, we see the burden also distributed unequally, where the people who tend to be more exposed to mosquitoes tend to have fewer resources, and the people who are hurt more by coming down to something like dengue or Zika or chikungunya, which may not be fatal, but will certainly knock you out for several weeks and cause you to lose a large amount of time of labor, require uh, um, support from family members who then also have to forego um, uh, other um, economic activities, you can see that this has a very, very um, different effect depending on the amount of resources, pe the, the resources that people have. And as a result, these diseases are huge drivers of poverty and inequality. So just as a starting board, mosquito-borne diseases are clearly an important thing that we should be studying. On a more general level, I will turn to a set of quotes that, uh, that Jim Carrey uh, gave in a, in a talk several years ago on biodemography, where he made the point that, well, um, the famous geneticist uh, Jobjansky said, nothing in biology makes sense in light of, except in light of evolution. And then James Ropel came in and said, well, nothing in evolution makes sense in light of demography. And Carrey says, that's great because everything in demography makes sense if you include entomology. So apart from the importance of mosquito-borne diseases, uh, mosquitoes happen to be very, very interesting, and understanding demography, thinking about insects as well, turns out to be very, very fruitful um, simply as a topic. And then the third point is simply, the more we get into this question of mosquitoes and mosquito borne diseases, the more we see that this really is a social science question at its heart. There's obviously a huge biological component, but you can't understand these diseases without understanding the social science part. In fact, you can't really understand mosquitoes without understanding people. The reason these mosquitoes, these vector mosquitoes that are transmitting the diseases I showed you are spreading around the world so fast is because they're hitchhiking rides in human transportation modes. They're laying their eggs in container ships and moving at large scales 
along shipping routes. They're flying as adults into our cars, into trains, buses, and they're moving at medium scales uh, through that mechanism. So, so simply the movement of these mosquitoes is tied directly to questions of human mobility. And then, of course, the spreading of the diseases requires both mosquitoes and humans. So we really have to understand this interaction between the two species. We actually, actually in fact, understand the networks that are created as mosquitoes bite humans, uh, pick up a disease, bite another human, transmit that disease to the other human. These are essentially networks that are being created in space. And that's, in fact, what we really need to understand if we want to um, understand and combat these diseases. So how do the new methods and data sources that are available us, to us allow us to get a better handle on mis the problem of mosquito-borne diseases? Well, one way is what I talked about is um, these new, in terms of new sources of data and new methods is that we have the possibility of networking our research participants together. And the idea of citizen science is actually not a new idea. Citizen science goes back many years with um, the idea that you can have uh, people who are not professional scientists participating in the process of scientific research. Uh, and of course, that, that's been done, in fact, for hundreds of years. There's been non-professional scientists who've made very important contributions to scientific research. What's new and the reason citizen science is really kind of blooming right now is that what we have is the possibility of networking all of those citizen scientists together um, through digital me means. That means we can do things like uh, create uh, applications that make it very easy for people to identify disease vector mosquitoes and to report those mosquitoes when they see them. We can link those reports in real time to expert entomologists who can then um, check the validity of the identifications. We can uh, deal with things like sampling bias, and that's what I'm going to focus on quite a lot. And we can produce what turn out to be quite, quite accurate results, and we can, we can validate these against traditional sources of information about, uh, about mosquito populations. And we can feed that information back, not only for researchers, but back to public health agencies who are involved in making day-to-day -day decisions about treatments. Um, I'm backing up here. So the first part of this is that um, people know a lot about mosquitoes, right? You don't need to be a scientist to know that you're being bitten by a mosquito. And in fact, to be quite annoyed by being bitten by a mosquito and quite motivated to participate and share information and be part of a research project. So um, what we found, uh, and this is about five years ago, um, working with colleagues uh, at the Center for Advanced Studies of Blanes and, um, and the, the CREAF, the Center of, uh, for um, Ecological Studies and Forestry Applications at the University of Autonoma de, de Barcelona, um, particularly Frederic Bartomeus and Aitana Oltra, we put together uh, a relatively, at first a relatively simple application to make it possible uh, to simply have this process going in a more automated fashion. Right? So we created an application that allowed people to do this reporting to identify the mosquitoes. And what we found very quickly was this was a powerful tool simply in terms of geographic coverage of where we were able to look for mosquitoes. So what I'm showing you here is a slide that in the top left with the, um, in the blue, shows you, uh, so right there, we've got the distribution of ovi traps around Spain uh, during 2014 and 2015. Ovi traps are the traditional method that we have for um, looking for mosquitoes, right? Entomologists go out, they put a small container of water, and they leave it for several weeks, usually about two weeks, and they come back and they check if there are eggs of the targeted species, in this case tiger mosquitoes, present in the water on a little wooden stick. Right? This is our traditional method of mosquito surveillance. And in 2014-2015, we had access to ovi traps that were basically around the coastal regions where we knew that there were already tiger mosquitoes or on the edges of those places where we knew that there were tiger mosquitoes. Um, nobody had the money to go around and put ovi traps anyplace else because this is expensive. You have to go out, you have to place the traps, you have to go and check them. And so where the mosquito control services and researchers tend to place traps are just at the edges, like where you would expect the next move of the mosquitoes to be. The other maps here show where we had citizen scientists participating in this project, which we call now Mosquito Alert. And these are our citizen scientists who participated during just those two years all over Spain. And then we have the worldwide distribution. So as you can see, we have this much, much greater geographic coverage as a result of opening up this process to citizen scientists. Um, what do we get from this? Well, at, at a very basic level, we got new detections of tiger mosquitoes as they moved into new municipalities 
but we tended to get them more quickly and in municipalities that we wouldn't have otherwise detected them in than with OV traps. So what we have here is, is a map that just shows when new, where, where, where the tiger mosquito was detected in a new municipality, what was the source of the detection? Was it citizen science alone? Was it OV traps alone? Or was it both sources? And the yellow shows the, the cases where we had citizen science alone driving these new detections, being, being the source of the new detection. Um, here we have, we can see southern Spain, we can see a little bit the area where we are. And one of the interesting things about this pattern is that what citizen science was really good at was getting us detections in unexpected municipalities, in the municipalities, in fact, that were farther from the known invasion area um, than we expected. So this is just, just to quantify that, you can see the yellow um, density plot and, and yellow um, box plots show the um, citizen science alone and citizen science in combination, uh, um, new, new municipal identifications as a function of their distance from the known invasion area. And so we see that the, the citizen science um, detections were giving us much farther distances from the known invasion area than, than the traditional methods. So simply as a source of surveillance, that's really, really useful. In addition, that starts to generate a number of interesting hypotheses, which in fact can be tested using citizen science scientists, at least in part. One of those hypotheses is, well, if mosquitoes are spreading faster than we expected, if they're, if they're just jumping over these municipalities that we expected to see them first and they're landing in far off municipalities, how are they doing that? And that hypothesis, as I already alluded to, is, well, maybe they're actually taking cars. Maybe they're hitchhiking. Uh, and at this stage, when we started this process, that was something that people had talked about, but we've never really been able to formally test it. And so one of the big advantages of involving citizen scientists was, well, we can simply ask them. We can say, all you people who are out there reporting mosquitoes to us, can you tell us if you see mosquitoes in your cars? Can you take photographs of them? And all of a sudden, we start getting back all of these photographs of smushed mosquitoes in people's cars. So that's one form of confirmation. We can then do that in a more formal way. We can go out and actually, and we did this, we went out and actually uh, vacuumed cars on the road to test if we actually could find mosquitoes in those cars, and we did. So that's another really useful aspect of this. But there are really three key questions that we still need to answer. One is, okay, even if it's useful as a surveillance tool, what about the problem of sampling bias? You'd expect that sampling bias would be a big, big issue here, right? We don't have people participating in citizen science. We wouldn't expect that we'd have those people evenly distributed across territory. So we need to be able to answer the question of whether in places where we see an abundance of uh, tiger mosquito reports, is that the result of the fact that we simply have an abundance of people participating there, or is it in fact the, fa the result of a, an abundance of tiger mosquitoes? And vice versa, if we have um, few tiger mosquito reports, is that because there's few tiger mosquitoes or because we simply have few participants? So, and that's a really an issue that we can only get at if we understand um, the social science component of how all of this is working. And we take a really demographic perspective on our population of participants within this project. The second component is how do we validate this? How do we know that this actually works? Right? One thing is to be able to detect faster than OV traps that a, new, new, that a new municipality has tiger mosquitoes. Another thing is to really try to understand the distribution of the tiger mosquito population over space. And we want to know, if, as we're doing that, if we're getting some sort of meaningful result. And then third question, which I think is the most exciting, is how do we interpret what we're getting from this? Uh, and I'll start off talking in a um, much more straightforward way about the interpretation as, well, we're learning, as I just said, about the distribution of the tiger mosquito population. We're using the human population to tell us ab about the tiger mosquito population, and we're going to validate that with other sources of information that we have about the tiger mosquito population. But in fact, we're getting something much more interesting because we're getting information about human mosquito contact. And it's that human mosquito contact that we really care about, right? That's what's driving the disease. So we're getting something that we don't get at all with traditional methods. And so we need to think more about how we interpret that information and how we can really exploit it. Okay, the sampling effort problem. Here's a very clear-cut example, right? So if we just look over time at our reports that we were getting with Mosquito Alert, we see we, this big spike at the end of 2015. Uh, and so the obvious question is whether that tells us that there was a big spike in the tiger mosquito population or it was simply an artifact of the participation dynamic, something about the way people were participating, the way they were being recruited, uh, et cetera. So um, one obvious starting point would be, okay, let's look at who's participating. Let's look, did we also have a spike of participants then? And what we see here, this, this shows over time, just new people joining the project. We don't have a spike, but what we do have at that time is we have a much uh, thicker, um, I mean, we, we don't have a taller spike than the others, but we have a much thicker spike. So we did indeed have more people joining the project at that time. 
The question is more complicated, though, because we care first about space. We want to know about the sampling effort problem as it occurs over space, not just everything pooled together and looking at points in time. Um, and in addition, we shouldn't be so uh, accepting of the idea that more participants should automatically translate into more reports. We should worry about how people are actually interacting with this application and what motivates people to participate at different times. And so that led us to start thinking about um, and, and really researching how much people are participating and what we can learn from information about those people about their propensity to send a report. But, but really, the question was how much are they actually looking, right? How much are they looking for mosquitoes? And so we came up with a model where we looked at, over time, how much people actually send any reports, right? How much after people install the application, how much do they actually report? How much do they do? And we tried to disconnect that from the question of are there tiger mosquitoes present or not. We looked at all types of reports. People through the application can report breeding sites, basically activity that people had with the application. And what we saw is um, uh, what is typical, I think, in a lot of um, internet-based studies, which is that people get very excited at first. People are really motivated to participate when they first download the application. They learned about it. They want to report a mosquito. And very quickly, their motivation drops off. Right? So if we look at participation time, so the number of days that somebody has had the app installed on their phone, we see that their probability of sending a report drops off very fast. And so we actually we modeled this. Um, and th these are the model results uh, as a function of some sort of intrinsic participant motivation using just random intercepts for each individual participant uh, and looking at the probability of sending any report um, uh, at, at that given time. So what we can do as a result of that is we can use those model results along with the basic information we have about um, where people are spending time in, who are participating in the project. And we can then get a much more accurate, or we think a much more accurate sense of the actual sampling that's going on in particular points in space. This is just to, to give you another sense of um, how that, that these, you know, the actual variable that we think is driving all of this changes over time. What, what we're seeing here is we think about this, if we think about participation time as like age, right? This is like our age distribution of our participants um, uh, over time, right? As time goes on, we have, you know, first a whole bunch of people sign up, then they keep the thing on their phone, so they age into longer and longer participation days, which then changes, according to our model, their propensity for actually reporting. Uh, new people are signing up, so we have these new bulges, which then work their way down the line. Um, so we, what we could do then is we can put that, those model results, into space. And what we did at first is we put them into space in this very coarse uh, set of approximately 20 kilometer sampling cells. One reason that we used this coarse sampling was for questions of privacy. Right? So we, we, since we realized from the beginning that we needed to know where our participants were, we incorporated a background tracking component into the application. So people are being tracked. And in fact, what, what's happening, and this is if they, if they uh, consent and if they, de if they decide not to turn this feature off, five times a day at random times, we sample their location. But we decided in the beginning we don't really want to know a lot about these people. We don't want to know anything personal about these people. We, in fact, we don't want to know their exact location. And of course, it would be better for the research if we did, but we really worried about the privacy aspect from the start. And so what we decided was, let's take, once the location is detected on the phone, let's have the phone simply put that, anonymize it into one of these sampling cells, and just send us the coordinate of that cell. Right? Just tell us what cell the person is in. Don't tell us where they are. And so what we get back is, is a, the distribution of our participants uh, at every point, you know, any point in time where these people are located in terms of those cells. We also then know how long each of those participants has had the app installed on their phone, and so we can use our model of um, reporting propensity to then build up a probability that somebody within that cell would have sent any report. And we can use that then as an offset, or, offset in our models uh, of the probability that there's actually an actual tiger mosquito human encounter in that cell in some period of time. Okay, so ultimately what we get from this, once we, and once we incorporate this idea of sampling effort, is we get, um, and the way we did this, we get a bi-week um, probability for that given cell, meaning what's the probability for a given two-week period that somebody within that cell, uh, that, that there was in fact an encounter between a tiger mosquito and a person within that cell, holding constant sampling effort, right? So we control for sampling effort as we do that. Just doing that, we can then compare our results with the results from the traditional approach, which would be, okay, let's put out an OV trap in that cell. Rather than send people out, 
let's put on an ovi trap and let's see whether we get tiger mosquito eggs. And what we see is that there's a great deal of correspondence between the results that we get from the citizen scientists and the results that we get um, from uh, just the traditional ovi traps. These are for, obviously for those limited sets of cells for which we had ovi trap data, so those cells that are along the coast. Um, but even with just those limited set of cells, that this is still a, a relatively wide area. Uh, and what we see is if we compare, for example, area under the curve, we get values of something like 0.85 if we look at the ovi trap model compared to the citizen science model data. Or if we compare the citizen science model data to the ovi trap raw data, right? So if we just simply predict yes or no tiger mosquito based on the citizen science data model, we can actually do a very good job of predicting whether there was in fact an egg in that cell, detected in that cell in an ovi trap uh, or not with an AUC of, of 0.78. So that as a starting point was really exciting. That meant that we could build up models in space and time at a very high resolution of the distribution of tiger mosquitoes uh, across Spain. This is Catalonia. Um, for, those th for that two-year period, right? These are our modeled estimates, and this is by municipality. We can actually go, go uh, to a finer grain and look at the sampling cells, but the municipalities give you a better and often more functional sense of what we're interested in. Um, we can also see all of Spain here for that, same, for that same period. For all of Spain, there's obviously there's more areas where we have um, no information because we didn't have people sampling or we didn't have uh, people sampling above the threshold that we set uh, for putting the information into the model. Uh, but we can see a, um, you know, really important information. Obviously, not all of this, these are probabilities, so not all of this means that there were, in fact, tiger mosquitoes uh, where those yellow or red um, municipalities are showing up, but there were elevated probabilities. And this is just, by the way, just based on the citizen science data. This is not incorporating anything about habitat suitability or all the other variables that you could then put in to get more, much more accurate predictions. So with that alone, we can do important things, like, for example, look at the flow of tiger mosquitoes or predict the flow of tiger mosquitoes uh, across provinces, right? Once we, at the scale that we have with the sampling cells, we can do a pretty nice job of understanding how tiger mosquitoes are flowing just by hitchhiking those rides that I talked about in the beginning. Um, based on our sampling of cars, we build up a probability of, you know, tiger mosquitoes getting into a car and actually surviving the journey and getting out. And we can then look, given what we know about commuting patterns, we can look at the potential flow of tiger mosquitoes across municipalities. Okay, that was phase one. Phase two is bringing this down to a smaller scale, and that's what we're involved in right now. Um, our initial ideas, our initial concern about privacy led us to this um, 20 square kilometer, approximately 20 square kilometer sampling cell. Um, as we get more into this, we realized that we would really like to have finer resolution information, and we came to the conclusion that we could do that without sacrificing privacy um, in a way that would be important. We can, in fact, bring the sampling cells down to five kilometers squares, five, five, five kilometers squared, and we could still uh, protect privacy in a reasonable way and get much more and more uh, interesting information from the perspective of understanding the spread of mosquito-borne diseases. So what we've been doing now is with those smaller sampling cells, so that's now incorporated into the application, we're getting, these, we're getting um, the background tracking at that smaller scale, we can compare our results to um, data that we have at a smaller scale. In this case, what we did is we compared it to data that we have in Barcelona on uh, adult tiger mosquitoes that fly into traps, right? So in addition to ovi traps, you also have much more expensive, but you have the possibility of putting out a trap that an adult tiger mosquito will fly into and get stuck in. So we have all of these traps that we placed around Barcelona, 19 traps, and they were checked every um, week by the Barcelona Public Health Agency. And so we can compare what we were learning from Mosquito Alert to what the Barcelona Public Health Agency was learning from these traps. What we find is there is, in fact, just in terms, look, if we pool all the data for Barcelona, Together, there's a correlation by week in terms of trap counts uh, and mosquito alert uh, reports, right? Um, and in particular, we still need to correct for sampling effort, right? So we still need to use this information about sampling effort um, to get this, uh, this correlation. We get a better correlation and, and a much more tighter fit if we look at the time series when we pool um, the data across years because, in fact, the mosquito alert data is relatively sparse uh, in time. Um, but we see a very, a very nice uh, pattern if we compare the two. Um, we can also see how important it is to include sampling effort, right? So if we don't use sampling effort, we, seem, we, don't, we, don't, we do a fairly poor job of actually predicting where these adult tiger mosquitoes are going to fly into traps. If we do not include sampling effort, um, in fact, if we log the units, we see that we do a much better job. Um, and if we model this just to test how important sampling effort is, we see that there's very clearly uh, an important role uh, in, of, of sampling effort in, in, in driving our results, right? So if we take the, the log of sampling effort here, 
um, controlling for the actual reports um, has a negative effect on uh, the the, uh, the counts that we're getting in the, uh, in the adults, so negative effect on our predicted counts in the adult traps. So based on that, we can start to build up much more high resolution models, and this is just what we're, based on that initial set of data, what, what we can do um, in terms of looking in space and time just within Barcelona, right? This, this is just Barcelona itself, and we can see uh, the areas where there seem to be higher um, probability of mosquitoes than others. Okay. First, key methodological issues, and then I want to talk about where this leads to, because what I've been talking about so far is basically, as I said, using human populations to understand mosquito populations. Um, and just from that, we can see a few key things that we need to be concerned about. One is how do we actually build up these data collection tools, right? So it's just from a very practical perspective, if you want to engage in this type of digital demography, and this is a very active approach, right? Rather than going out and looking for um, passive, you know, looking for breadcrumbs, looking for uh, traces of people's activity that are already existing on servers and on other digital um, devices, what if we actually actively ask, ask people to participate and share information? Well, if we do that, we need to build up tools. And that presents a practical problem that we need to think through. We need to actually think about how we build those tools. And we need to think about the way that the, with, uh, building the, those tools that we create are going to um, you know, interplay with our recruitment and retention of participants. One thing that I've seen over time in doing this and having several iterations, both of the Mosquito Alert tool and previous tools that I've worked on for simply looking at human trajectories, is that this is becoming harder. When Android was first released in 2008, it was very easy to recruit people. Um, and with a group of people at Princeton, I put together uh, you know, some, with, with computer scientists and social scientists, um, including Tom Espenshade and Matt Salganik, Matt Salganik and a bunch of um, uh, computer scientists there, we put together a very simple application simply to look at human trajectories. And when Android was first released, everybody wanted to try it. There was very few apps on the market, and the idea that there was this group of researchers who were interested in human mobility was exciting for people. So we immediately got people reviewing it and immediately got people downloading the app without having to do any advertising or any actual recruitment. We got people all over the world. Over time, that effect died off, right? We have this huge flood of apps on the market, and that means that as researchers, we end up competing with app development firms that are, you know, have a lot to gain by attracting people's attention. And it's very difficult to compete on that, uh, on, in that field. So we either need to invest more money in actual things like user interface and design and things that are useful for the people who are using the apps, or we need to pick questions that people really want to be involved in anyway. And from that perspective, the mosquito question is perfect. Right? People get bitten by mosquitoes. They simply want to report it. They don't, they're not thinking about do they want to be spending a time on another app. They want anything that allows them to do that. And that's not something that other app developers are really competing for. So it may be that simply based on the subject matter, we can get people's attention. Or we may need to turn to traditional methods of recruitment or traditional methods augmented by sort of new digital methods. But it may be that we simply need to go out and ask people and perhaps even give them compensation in order to get them to participate. And rather than sinking the money into better, more exciting apps and user interfaces, we could sink the money into compensation, advertising, things like that. So that's one issue. Um, algorithmic bias is another issue. That's something that came up through the, uh, you know, the experience most famously of Google flu trends, right? Where um, the Google using the data that they were getting on, on from searches, uh, you know, had this very highly publicized flu trends approach where they were being able, they were able to predict quite well um, uh, cases of flu in the United States. They were able to predict it very well until they stopped being able to predict it well. And one of the big criticisms that came out of that was the problem that you have these algorithms that are involved in the research end up changing, and they don't always change based on the researchers' needs or in ways that the researchers even know about, right? So if you're using some other platform to get this data that you're interested in, you need to be aware that that platform may be changing, and that platform is not designed for you probably, and therefore there may be changes in the way the algorithms work that affect the data collection process. In fact, that's something that we're seeing right now with Mosquito Alert, even though we're the ones who designed it, right? So we designed Mosquito, World, Mosquito Alert. I built the initial app. Now we contract it out. But everything that's involved in those algorithms, we decide. But of course, the app runs on Android and iOS, and Android and iOS are changing. And so what we found was that Android, when Android got um, hit version 8, there was a change which involved the way that um, sort of this background um, functionality operates, right? And in fact, we didn't realize it at first but we started losing uh, the background tracks from people who were upgrading to Android 8 as a result of that. So right now we're in the process of sorting that out and trying to make sure that we're not 
uh, losing information as a result of these things. So it's, it's, it's actually very, very complicated and quite difficult and time consuming to deal with all of these changes. And you realize that you're, you know, you start creating a piece of software, it's tied in with a whole larger ecosystem and it needs to be able to play well with that ecosystem. And you need to be able to understand what's going on and all the changes that are, that are coming out of it. And then another key methodological point that I want to highlight because it's, it extends well past the question of mosquitoes is, I mean, more, it's sort of generally filling in missing data, but in this context, filling in missing data about human trajectories. So at the heart of this is understanding human movement, right? Where, where our participants are located. What I'll talk about now in terms of the future is it's what, we're moving in the direction where we actually want to learn a lot more about those human trajectories. <laughs> That's an issue where you need to think a little bit about what you're actually getting because your assumption if you're just going into this is, well, we can get information from the GPS receiver on the phone and therefore we can get a really, really high resolution trajectory, which is sort of true, but you're always going to be missing points, right? You're always going to have points where you weren't sampling because you're not sampling constantly because if you, you were, you'd be draining the person's battery. Um, you're always going to be having some scale at which you're sampling in time. And people are always going to have dead spots where they either turn off their GPS receiver because they want to save batteries or they're in a you know, concrete room where they're not getting any reception. You're also going to have these missing spots and you need to figure out how to fill in that spatial information about, about human behavior in those spots. And it's interesting because as I've you know, gotten into this research, on one hand I found that there's a big need for a social science perspective in these questions that are involved in ecology and, 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 um, and biology. Uh, and there's a big need for using our social science models in those areas. But for this, there's a really, really good use that we can make of models and techniques that are coming out of ecology, and particularly movement ecology. So ecologists have spent a lot of time studying animal tracks, right? In fact, probably more time than we've been spending studying human tracks because you can track animals more easily. You, you could do this, obviously, before cell phones. Um, and so they've developed a whole range of techniques for filling in these gaps, for modeling what a trajectory might have looked like and for dealing with that uncertainty of those areas where we don't know, in fact, where people are. Uh, and one interesting area of research that, I've, that, I, um, that I think is worth exploring more in the human context is what is called Brownian bridging, right? So this idea that if you uh, know the locations in time, uh, you know, two locations in time and space of some uh, individual, but you don't know what's happening in between it, you can impose some assumption. And one very simple assumption would be, let's assume that there was just Brownian motion going on. Obviously, that's not likely what people are doing, but if you don't know anything else, that's not a bad assumption to start with. And if we know that there's just simply Brownian motion going on that got the person from here to here, then we can build up a, um, a probability density of where that person might have been in between those two points in space and time. So I think that's a useful area for, for future exploration. Okay, future directions as, um, as I'm thinking about it in terms of mosquito research, but with an eye towards what types of questions all of this could lead you to in other areas as well. One question is really building up more information about what I'm thinking of as the socio-ecological context of mosquito-borne disease. And what all of this allows us to do, first simply by getting a much finer resolution picture of the distribution of the mosquito population, is to start thinking about hypotheses about why the mosquito population is as it is. And we often, or at least the way entomologists often think about that is they look at habitat suitability, they look at weather, they look at things like that. From a social science perspective, though, we know that there's a big relationship between where the mosquitoes are and where people are. Part of that is the transportation issue. Part of that is because mosquitoes are simply attracted to people as, um, as a source of blood meals. And there looks like there's a very interesting variation in the way that process works. And so one hypothesis that I've been working on is that, in fact, not only does mosquito-borne disease drive social inequality, but social inequality also drives mosquito populations. What I mean by that is that it seems that there's a, uh, areas where higher levels of inequality, right, sort of, sort of a higher gradient between rich and poor, turns out to be really, really good habitat for mosquitoes. And the reason that would be would be because areas where there's a lot of litter, uh, poor garbage collection, <laughs> end up having lots of containers that fill up with water and become good breeding sites for the mosquitoes. And areas where that may not be the case, but there's a lot of water input, so there may be a lot of wealth, there may be lawn care, there may be human inputs of water into the environment, also turn out to be areas where there's very good breeding sites. And in fact, those areas you may have less complaints about mosquitoes because people may be indoors with air conditioning more frequently. And so what you have is two different types of breeding sites and the mosquitoes can really play off that. And, and there's a whole you know, theory within ecology of, of um, metapopulation stability, 
which hinges on the idea that you have this you know, heterogeneous environment and you have these subpopulations that are not completely connected such that when one dies off, because there may be a control effort in one type of area, the other populations still remain and they can very quickly repopulate the areas that, where the mosquito was eradicated. So there's good reason to think that you know, really important socioeconomic questions are at the heart of the, simply the distribution of disease vector mosquitoes themselves. Uh, this is just to give you a sample of what some of the breeding sites look like where we find tiger mosquitoes. And these, these are photos that come from mosquito alert from, uh, from citizen scientists themselves. Another part of it, though, and I think this is really a, an interesting area for, for further thinking, and again, this is something that you can tie into a lot of other areas, is that question that I started with before of how do we interpret the results? What if we say that you know, in addition to simply understanding the distribution of the mosquito population, we're going to try to get farther into that question of human-mosquito interactions. What if we really want to do something with that information? The fact that we know that it's not just that people are going around looking and seeing mosquitoes, but they're, they're reporting mosquitoes when the mosquitoes are in fact biting them. What that means is we're getting information about the biting network itself, right? That biting network is the key for the, the, for the um, spread of the disease. And we can, in fact, put that network in space. So what I'm showing you here is just you know, our predictions at the municipality level from Mosquito Alert of the distribution of tiger mosquitoes. And then just a, um, just a diagram of what a biting network might look like if we were able to really observe it, where we have, you know, we have two types of nodes in this network. We have the blue, which are mosquitoes, which are more numerous. We've got the orange, which are people. And they're connected to each other, right? Mosquitoes are connected to people. And it turns out that this actually is a really, really important question for understanding the disease dynamics. Because even if we're not ever going to be able to you know, fully reconstruct that network, if we can learn something about the topology of that network, we can learn really important information about how did the disease is spread. And one key information, piece of information about the topology is what's called the degree distribution. How many, for each human, how many mosquitoes is that human connected to? <laughs> For each mosquito, how many humans is that mosquito connected to? That's the distribution of degrees across um, each population in, the net, in that network. And what it turns out is that that distribution has a huge effect on basic parameters of the disease dynamics, including things like the basic reproductive number, which tells us whether the disease is going to be growing or shrinking. Um, and if we have uh, exponential type distributions, distributions that start to look like scale-free distributions of those degrees, right? then in fact R0 may be much higher than we would expect if the distribution was something more uniform. This is something we know almost nothing about. Right? We know that that's the case from simulations. We know that changing the, de the degree distribution would in fact change basic parameters like R0, but we know almost nothing about the degree distribution for mosquitoes and humans in real life. But we could find this out. What we have here is a tool that would allow us to find that out because we can actually ask people to give us more information about their experience of being bitten. We're already getting information in the form of reports when people are bitten and they manage to slap a mosquito and identify it. But if we think about other ways of asking people to tell us about their experiences of being bitten, we can build up information about how many different mosquitoes a person has been bitten by. Obviously, these are going to be rough estimates, but we can combine, combine that then with traditional sources of data um, other more direct observations and types of analysis, and we can really learn something important about these, um, the, the, the topography of these networks, and then we can put them explicitly into space because we have that, and we have the tools to do it, and we have the ability to do that at the scales that we think are going to be most important. So I hope that's given you a sense of, you know, what within one small area of digital demography uh, I see as, uh, as exciting. And I hope that you'll be able to take some of that and draw on it for the areas that you're interested in, because I think a lot of it connects very much to a lot of other areas uh, and a lot of other things that hopefully you'll be thinking about for the next several days. So thank you very much. Um, I'll be happy to take questions now.